everybody. Good afternoon. I'm so honored and delighted to be here today. And thank you for all of you for joining in the midst of this beautiful summer day. And thank you to Kavod Senior Life for this wonderful month of programming. So impressive. And we're so fortunate to uh, have the technology that we do that allows us to meet like this at in uncertain times. The hugs aren't great, but uh, one thing I've learned this past year working on Zoom and teaching on Zoom is that uh, we can penetrate that 2D screen with the power of our eyes. So uh, there's a magic trick. It's not very magical at all. Uh, if you go up to the right hand, to the right hand uh, of your top of your menu and you press view and then you go to, can we get on gallery, side by side gallery? Gabriel, and uh, get off the PowerPoint for just a moment. There we go. And we can actually see each other, and it's wonderful. And I'm seeing old friends. Um, there are three screens in my uh, on my computer, maybe different on yours. But it's wonderful to look each other in the eye and just say hello. There is uh, Rabbi Stephen Booth Nadav. Wonderful to see you. Gosh. And um, some of you I haven't seen in a long time. And some of you don't have your eyes showing, but that's okay. You have your names up. So um, wonderful to be together today to culminate a beautiful conference. Over the past year, and we'll go back to uh, my face, uh, Gabriel, if you don't mind, not the PowerPoint quite yet. I know many of you, but uh, not all of you. And it's uh, so good to meet meet you and our co-sponsors today. Uh, this has been quite a year, <laughs> an unspeakable year. And I think it will be a watershed for so much learning. And we have each of us on this call made it through. We're alive. We've made it through the eye of the needle and we've survived. And now, thank God, we can continue to live our lives and thrive. But maybe, just maybe, what we've gone through these past many months has changed us. And I wanna begin by talking about that. Maybe we have learned a few life-changing things. So if I were to ask you, what was the net effect of COVID-19 for you, what would you say? Uh, you can just think about that for a moment. What are, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? And would you just type in a word or more right now in the chat column? You can go to the bottom of your menu and, and press chat and just type into everyone, was this past year empowering? Was it humbling? Was it isolating? Was it educational? How would you say the past year affected you? I would love to know. And uh, many of us learned self-care. It was emotionally draining. Yes, intolerance. Wow, resilience, yes. Importance of humanness, yes. Humility, a time of hope and faith. Many of us got a chance to introspect and we are being asked to increase the volume a little bit. I'll do that from my end. More wine, yes. <laughs> um, we became reclusive. We became humble. We remembered each other and that, that uh, people are suffering. How to feel comfortable with isolation, aloneness ourselves. Yes, very beautiful. Thank you all for writing in. For many of us, COVID-19 was a catalyst. It woke us up to many things in our culture that we simply weren't fully aware of. We didn't know, for instance, that healthcare workers would sacrifice their own health for us. And in many cases, they sacrificed their lives to take care of us. Doctors and nurses actually died in the process even to the point, uh, some of some of them I heard moved into their garage to keep their uh, to keep working in the hospitals to spare their families. It sure took a toll. 
And many of us were unaware that around the country, myself included, I did not know that a person's ethnicity determined what kind of health care you would receive. Uh, that some, so many of us were underprivileged and you couldn't even find the shots. Uh, it was an education to learn that people of color or indigenous people could not as easily receive vaccines when they wanted them. Uh, and there was a confluence of the COVID, COVID health crisis and racial upheaval uh, beginning la last year at this time. Many of us were surprised that people would come out in the midst of a pandemic to protest racial inequality, to say enough is enough, not only in the US, in 20 or more cities around the US, but around the world as well. I cried a lot. I know that all over the country, there were stories that brought tears to my eyes, to our eyes over the tragedies and the lives that were cut short, as well as from the nobility and the sheer goodness of common people. COVID was a catalyst. It woke us up to many things within ourselves. How important real in-person hugs are, how much we need touch to be alive, how important our animals are, bird songs, trees, how good a walk around the block can make us feel. Does anyone wanna write in right now what you learned about yourself this past year? What worked for you? Some of you did, but I'd love to hear more. What were the tricks of the trade that you learned to keep healthy, to keep normal? What would you like to share? So I wanna tell you something as we're doing that, that I learned powerfully in this pandemic. And it has to do with our, uh, many of us are Jewish here, maybe not all. Uh, this is the strange and sacred meaning of COVID-19. The strange and sacred meaning of COVID-19. So we're gonna get a little bit of uh, Kabbalah here. We're gonna get a little bit of some mysticism here and Hebraic, ancient Hebraic teachings. As the COVID-19 virus spread throughout the world, each of us had to recalibrate our lives, right? We had to slow down. We had to stop taking for granted our daily privileges and doing a little research. I learned that in ancient times, when a natural calamity happened, such as a plague, which you could call this a plague, in the olden days they would have, an earthquake, a flood, a tsunami, it was often understood by the ancient people to be a sign that our leaders and their people were out of alignment with the great powers, with heaven. It was seen as a sign that the people were not living with respect for what I call that which is greater than us, for lack of better word. Uh, and the acronym that uh, I use is TWIG, which is why I have a little apple twig there. That which is greater than us, it's the word that I use a lot these days because, uh, because who knows about our religious faiths and a God doesn't mean the same thing for everybody and for some people it's just a, a, a misnomer. So I say twig, that which is greater than us. So in the olden days when a natural disaster or catastrophe occurred, for example, in China, it was understood that that which is greater than us was pushing back at us and saying, wait a minute, who do you think you are? Who's really in control here? You humans seem to have gotten out of bounds. And in Jewish culture, natural disasters were thought to have been a tochacha. That's a Hebrew word that means a sacred rebuke from that which is greater than us uh, to say, hey, consider what's happening. Stop, put the pause button on for a moment. And then the people would go, oh, they would respond. And natural responses to a, a, a pandemic, to a flood or to a drought would be fasting. People would fast, people would give charity. People would say, 
would say special prayers to say to the Holy One, Shamati, I hear you, I heard you. So you know I'm a rabbi, and I'm the type of rabbi who doesn't, I don't readily subscribe to the reward and punishment model, nor do I believe that there's a God in the sky who's waving his finger at us with a long white beard. I genuinely hold to the principle that the divine power lives inside of each of us, that we are part of this great oneness, this great totality. When we say the Shema Yisrael, we say Echad, the oneness, uh, and we proclaim that there is oneness that we are part of. So we'll go to the next slide because that Echad or oneness, it was also spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when yep. he said, we're all part of a single garment of destiny. We're all part of a single garment of destiny. And what he was describing uh, was this echad. And now we might say that the seamstress of that single garment of destiny, that deep intelligence who fashions all of us, who holds all of us that we are part of, really got my attention during COVID because I realized that the name that the World Health Organization, the WHO, called COVID-19 was very interesting. And here is a beautiful ren rendering of the word kavod in Hebrew. Kavod is so close to COVID. Uh, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to know that COVID and kavod are, are anagrams for each other. Kavod, let's talk about that word, kavod, which is also our beautiful sponsor's name, the honor, respect, and humility that we owe each other. The honor, respect, and humility that we owe each other. So all through Judaism, we have kavod harav, honoring the rabbi, kavod avim, honoring our parents, etc. And uh, in, in the Torah, we have Mos Moses who says to God, Oh, hareni na'at kavodecha, please show me your glorious kavod, which means show me your presence, God. Wow. So what if we understood COVID-19, this horrible virus, which our ancestors would surely have called a plague. What if we understood COVID-19 as God's formidable face that shows up, that showed up to admonish us, to correct us, to love us back into our rightful place as creatures of this earth, not masters, but creatures, created beings, reminding us to live with respect, reminding us to live with honor for one another and for ourselves and for that which is greater than us, twig and for our aging process. If we can do that, then we are not in COVID, we are in kavod, living with humbleness. So the ancients, our ancient sages might say that kavod and COVID, hear, hear how, how close they sound, are two sides of one coin, and that we've been reminded to get back into balance and live more humbly. So this is also a shout out to our wonderful host and sponsor and to you, Gabriel, um, for all that you do. Many of us have enjoyed uh, Kavod's uh, residential uh, living situation and life enrichment programs, Kavod on the road, the Kavod team. Take a look and see if you're in these pictures. And be because I'm not being... Uh, uh, simply gratuitous here, I'm saying that Kavod's values are exactly what we're talking about, honor, respect, and humility. So thank you again to Kavod. Now, as Gabriel told you, I'm a, also a psychologist, and I, I have worked for many, many years, <laughs> decades, I should say, uh, as a rabbi, very happily, as a rabbi serving families. And I got about uh, 10 years ago 
is it, it's exactly 10 years ago, I got a voice from my kishkas saying, time to go back to school. Time to go back to school to study what I'm learning. What is it? What do the scholars say about what I'm learning about Jewish families these past decades? I was super aware that there was something sitting in the back room, so to speak, that makes us who we are as a tribe. What is this? Our ingenuity, our street smarts, our ability to survive the worst traumas, our sensitivity, our creativity. And then there's also the other things that members of our tribe harbor, like anxiety and impatience, agitation. I believe we come by those things honestly. So what was it that I was feeling? I went back to school to study uh, collective trauma and collective traumatic history and what that does to a nation, what it does not only to us, because we by no means have an exclusive claim uh, to an intense traumatic history. Other ethnicities in the United States, as we know, our black neighbors, our Native American compatriots, all of us, and I wanna say this very clearly, all of us who have ancestors, who lived through extreme life stories, through discrimination, through extreme poverty and injustice, who were displaced. Our people were displaced, right? Our, the indigenous people were displaced, the black people were displaced. All of us have special legacies within us and special work to do on ourselves and special work to do in the world because of that. And all of us who have these trauma legacies have a special privilege to, to be empathic and to work for tikkun olam, the repair of the world. But before we get to tikkun olam, I think it's important that we understand ourselves in the light of, you see this one, one person standing out there, seeing ourselves within the bigger picture of our history. Each one of us must come to grips with our past. Now, scientists call this, I, this is where there's a convergence. There's a beautiful confluence of science and spirituality. Now, science calls this kind of living, understanding our past, a kind of digestion. They call it metabolizing our past, metabolizing what life has brought to us. It, we all digest our food, right? And when we digest our food, what does it do? When we digest our food well, when our digestive system is working well, the way we want it to, it breaks down our food and it, it, it issues, it, it, it uh, gives us energy. It gives us fuel, usable fuel. And in the same way we scientists say, you have to metabolize or break down process and integrate the events of our lives, whether those are traumatic events or any events, we all have big events in our lives and losses and heartaches in our lives. And we also have good events, wonderful events, simchas in our lives that we have to break down, metabolize so that we can get the energy from them. So how do we do that? How do you metabolize life? Let's look at how humans digest the past. Here are three simple words to remember. Remember, tell, and find. Remember, tell, and find. Now we're going to remember those three simple words. And first, we must remember what has happened, what life has brought our way. And that's no easy feat. First of all, because our memories get blurry. Mine certainly does. And so it takes work. It takes work to comb through our past. And it's natural to want to just move on and get, get over it and get past it. And people will tell us, just get over it. Get past it. When we have a death, get past it. And we want to forget unpleasant events as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, many of us want to get past COVID and go back to the good old days. But we do need to harvest to remember so that we can harvest the, the lessons. And when we comb through the past, 
we come upon some very important things that are useful to remember. We don't want to go back to remember how hard COVID was, but when we do, we realize that the hardships and the isolation brought our way <laughs> more character. We remember that we rose above the suffering. We remember that there were amazing people that we read about in the newspapers and our neighbors, and we were amazing. Uh, we remember the moments when we rose abo uh, above our angst and our fear, and we cared for one another. We picked up the phone. We brought people food. And if your memory is less than perfect, like mine is, I want you to trust that the important things will come back to you. So get out the photo albums, read the old letters, connect with old friends, call family members simply to reminisce remember and then we must tell hey remember that story remember when remember to tell others our stories i love these two women uh, they're having a great they're having a blast telling did you know that telling your story is sacred in judaism it's the reason we are still here it's the reason why we are a cohesive people We've been telling our stories for thousands of years. Remember the Seder, the Passover Seder, the meaning of Haggadah is the telling, to tell. It's a mitzvah to tell. And when we tell and when our story is actively listened to and heard, there is truly a kind of magic that's heard. In a moment, I'm gonna tell you a story about this, uh, about being witnessed when we tell a story is so important. That's where healing comes from. So we have to remember, and then we have to tell, and last, we must find. And what is the finding? We must find meaning. We must find meaning in our stories. We have to look at them with a magnifying glass and find what's the meaning. We must discover, and those of you who know Hebrew, you can see the word limbed so to find in the in the magnifying glass here in the Torah we have to discover what we can learn about ourselves and our life experiences that matters most to harvest the meaning because harsh events that have befallen us our losses and our tragedies and the great mysteries and the unexpected turns in our lives all change when we find some meaning in them, some way that we can be deepened by them, whether it's because we become more compassionate or more empathic. And Viktor Frankl, who many of us know, he wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning, said this, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. Um, Two years ago, I'm going to say this is off script, Gabriel, but um, July 10th, it's coming up. I have a yard site on July 10th. Uh, two years ago, I was speaking for you. It was my first, uh, my first experience of Kavod. And as I was speaking, one of my children died. And uh, it, was, it was a completely life-changing thing. And it's probably taken me all of these two years to wrestle to cry, to wrestle, to mourn, to grieve, to tell, to remember, to pull out the pictures, to just just yell at God, uh, how could this happen? And um, I, I think it's a lifelong journey, but finding the meaning, finding how I can harvest beauty and more compassion for others is, is uh, the meaning. And so I have a very special relationship with you, Gabriel, and a very special relationship with Rabbi uh, Stephen and and with Kavod because of that anniversary that's coming up. So now I want to tell you another story. And uh, find your glass of water or a cup of tea. And we'll go into story mode. <clears throat> this is also a true story, and it's a story that I tell in my book, Wounds into Wisdom is a story about a man who was once a little boy. And uh, he was four years old. He's now a war hero in Israel. 
but the story is of him being a four-year-old boy living with his two young parents. They were uh, hardly 20 years old when the Nazis came to Poland. And the Nazis corralled all of the Jews into one tiny corner, a few streets of the city of Krakow, and put barbed wire fencing all around it and called it the Krakow Ghetto. And one night, Avi's parents heard that the next morning, all of the hundreds of children who lived in that ghetto were gonna be rounded up and taken away. And Avi's mother and father said, no, we are not gonna allow this. And they decided to act. And they dressed Avi in his warmest clothes and many layers and his mother wrapped her shawl around him. This is in the middle of the night. And she gave him two things. She gave him a little slip of paper with an address, which happened to be the address of the brothel in Krakow, where women were trying to help harbor children. That was one thing. And a tiny photograph, a little student photograph, as big as a, you know, like a tiny, like a, as big as a postage stamp, really, from her student ID. And she locked eyes with her little boy just makes me cry to tell the story every time because it was so, so powerful. And she said, whenever you need me, take out this picture. Whenever you're scared, look at my eyes and talk to me, Avi, and I will be there. Don't forget, hold on to this picture more than anything else. I will be there. Just talk to me and look at me. And then just after midnight, when the guards were looking the other way, his parents, Avi's parents, slipped him through the barbed wire. And he dutifully went out into the middle of the night in the midst of Nazi-occupied Poland, found the brothel. He was taken in for a little while there before the Nazis came and disbanded them. And for the next three years, that little boy endured the war, a four-year-old on the streets and in the, and in the woods and in people's homes and squatting in, in debris. And when he got overwhelmed, when he got completely freaked out, he took out that photograph, that tiny photo, and he looked at his mother and he talked to her and he said, mommy, I'm scared. Mommy, I don't want this war. When is it going to be over? When will I see you again? And he said later, this picture saved his life because he had someone to tell, someone that would witness his pain and turmoil, which is what we all need. And finally, at the war's end, his parents miraculously survived. They looked like skeletons. They had teeth hanging out and they, he couldn't, Avi couldn't even recognize them and he couldn't, they couldn't recognize him, but they found him. And a couple of years later, they all emigrated to Pal what was then Palestine. And when he was barely a teenager, he joined the Israeli Defense Forces and became a nationally acclaimed Air Force pilot and hero. But on the inside of this young man, he was racked with PTSD. He was racked with fear. He was racked with turmoil. And he never spoke. He never told his story. He never spoke of his trauma. Every night, he would wake up drenched in sweat with horrible nightmares about the Nazis. Every night he was on this horrible conveyor belt going toward the, the killing machines and he couldn't get off of it. And for 35 years, he never told anyone his story. He married, he had several children, he never told them his story. So take a breath because it's a, such a powerful tale. A few years ago, a wonderful scholar named Dori Laub, a Romanian Holocaust survivor who became a psychologist and went to Yale to teach. And there he began the Fortunoff uh, uh, archives, this, the, the Holocaust survivor archives. And he heard that there was a war hero in, Pal in Israel named 
this by his name, by Avi's name, which by the way is a pseudonym that I was asked to use. And he heard that he survived the Krakow ghetto operation to take all the children. He was incredulous and he contacted Avi and he said, I really want you to tell your story. And he, Avi said, no way, I'm not, I'm not into that. I've never told it, I'm not interested. Let bygones be bygones, I'm fine. Just let sleeping dogs lie. No, he resisted, his wife began to press him. She said, I've been living with you for decades. You've never told me your story. I feel like I don't know you. His children pressed him and finally he agreed. And after 35 years, he told the story of himself as a four to seven and a half year old child living on the streets in the war, how he had survived with the help of that tiny little picture, his mother's photograph. And he spoke before thousands of people. He finally told his story. So that night, the night that he was recorded on these archival videos, Avi began to have the same nightmare. There he was again on the conveyor belt, going toward the killing machines. And he went, oh God, no, not this again. I can break this pattern. Suddenly, because he told his story, he had the energy, he had the, he, he had the fuel to break with that pattern and he jumped off the conveyor belt and he ran and he was saved in his dream for the first time and he never had that nightmare again. So you see that when we metabolize our past, when we break it down, when we remember, tell and find meaning, we can digest and get fuel from the past. Avi had to return to his story, remember it so that he could tell it and tell the world so that he could find meaning. And in telling, he found, and in being witnessed, that's really the key, telling and being heard, he found meaning and he had this enormous healing. So let's take a breath again and take another sip of water if you have one close. L'chaim to all of us. So let's talk, let's go to, let's go to the next slide, Gabriel, where we see, a, go back to science. There's a whole discipline now called post-traumatic growth. We know about post-traumatic stress disorder, but did you know that there's such a thing as PTG? I love those acronyms post-traumatic growth, when we go through trauma, when we go through loss and tragedy, and we do that work of metabolizing our losses, our tragedies, we, we wrestle them, we, we find meaning in them, and we get growth, we get fuel, we get energy. Equally, there are effects of our people's collective trauma that are influencing us. And when we digest, them and when we do the work uh, we can we can we can get huge amounts of fuel let's do another piece of science and skip to the next slide when when extreme life challenges my friends are not digested what happens what happens so they cling to us and here's uh, for the last 15 years I would say there's a new branch of science called epigenetics. Epigenetics demonstrates with proof, with evidence, that the extreme life experiences of our ancestors impact future generations. It's not that you see here the coil of our DNA. It's not that our ancestors experiences changes our DNA. It doesn't change our genetic makeup, but what it does is changes how we express our uh, DNA, how we resilient, how resilient we are, how we uh, bounce back from stress, how anxious we get. And when we metabolize or when we digest our past, what we change in ourselves is the 
coils, we call them the methylation on top of the DNA, epigenetics is on top of our gene structure, that allows us to be fully resilient and fully bounce back and get the fuel that we need, get the energy that we need, and get the smarts that we need. So uh, our extreme life experiences, when we look back, when we tell them, when we get them hear, heard, heard, when we get them witnessed, when we make meaning and harvest, our life experiences turn into fuel and then they don't cling to us and won't cling to those who come after us, our children and our grandchildren. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So, so far we've talked about three, two things, the strange and sacred meaning of COVID-19. We, we linked it to Kavod, how our past can fuel our present when we remember, tell, and harvest the meaning, find meaning. Now I wanna shift gears with your permission and talk about something more rabbinic talk about tapping into the mystical gifts of our ancestors. In Hebrew, our ancestors are called, does anyone know? Some of you who know how to read Hebrew or know the liturgy know our ancestors are called Avot ve'imahot, our fathers, our forefathers, and our foremothers. And I wanna talk about a different kind of memory, a far memory in which we, on which we uh, connect with our ancestors from farther back. And we'll go to the next slide, which I love. Uh, this give us a big view of our, uh, of our, an overview, a 30,000 foot view, if you will. And let's, so let's ask, what does Judaism actually teach about death and dying. Let's ask, where do we go and where are our ancestors? And I want to say a little off script, as a rabbi, I get this, I get this a question that really kind of upsets me all the time, which is, oh, Rabbi Firestone, I learned that when the Jews believe that when you die, it's lights out and curtains, and there's nothing that happens after death. Is that right? And I go crazy. I want to pull my hair out because that's not true at all. For thousands of years, Jews have been saying, our sages have been teaching, no, actually, that's not true. What Jews believe, what Judaism teaches is this, and I want to be very clear about this. Judaism teaches that death is not the end of us. Judaism teaches that after our physical life is over, our bodies are recycled. The Torah tells us dust to dust and ashes to ashes, but our souls, our neshama, continues to live on. Jews believe for, from time immemorial that our ancestors' merits are their goodness, their prayers, their, their salt of the earth merits help those who remain here on earth. And some of you know that in Jewish liturgy, we pray by calling the names of, of Abraham and Sarah and all of our forefathers and foremothers. Do you remember the, the prayer of the Amida? Elohe Abraham v'sara, Elohe Yitzchak v'rivka, Elohe Yaakov, Rachel Valeha. So we call upon our ancestors to, to pray. And similarly, there's a time honored Jewish ritual of going to the graves of our parents and our grandparents and our spiritual teachers, right? We make, a, some of us know that you make a pilgrimage to, uh, to the, the Rebbe or you go to the graves before Rosh Hashanah, before Yom Kippur, how many of us have done that? Uh, if you're of a Hasidic bent, you might even bring a kvitlach. You bring written prayers that are placed in and around the stones of their graves. Some of us have brought kvitlach to the Kotel, to the, the Wailing Wall. While we're not praying to our ancestors, we're 
asking them for assistance. We're asking them to lift up our prayers. So in a way, Judaism believes what the scientists are saying, that our ancestors live on. Like our ancestors, we live on. And like our ancestors, life goes on. Our ancestors are alive within us and they are with us. So they are alive in their legacies to us, both their genetic and their epigenetic inheritance to us. But I want you to consider this on a spiritual level, uh, and we'll come back to, to me, uh, Gabriel, thank you. I want you to consider this, all who are listening to me right now, on a spiritual level, the sages believe that our ancestors are still alive in another dimension in the next world and that our ancestors actually want to help us. They are available to help us. They're available to lend us power. They're available as spiritual guides and they're available as intercessors. That means they intercede on our behalf. So, um, I want to end my talk today with an interactive, uh, with, a, with a guided meditation, which will be interactive. If you're there, there we go. I want you to just take a look at this beautiful picture for a moment. This is actually a, a, a rendering of a real place in California where there are old, old trees on either side and you can walk through toward the light. So um, I want you to take a little stretch, if you will. Just make sure your body is not getting too tight sitting there. Uh, stretch your hands and wiggle your toes. And take a good breath. And if you're willing, I want you to imagine with your eyes open or closed, you can look at this picture or you can just close your eyes. Imagine that you are in a beautiful line of trees, just like that. And you're walking and you're very relaxed and very comfortable. The temperature is just right. Your breathing is good. Your walking is good. And you feel fantastic because you feel that these trees are embracing you. And as you walk to the end of this little avenue of trees toward the light at the end, someone loving is waiting for you there. Someone who's no longer on this earth as someone who is smiling at you, who knows you, who recognizes you. Someone who is very well and wise. Someone who cares for you unconditionally. And you feel them beaming at you right now, embracing you with their care and their love how good it is to see them again. So take a moment and see who you see. Who is the ancestor at the end of this avenue? Who is there for you? And if you would suspend your disbelief right now and just let your imaginal wisdom take over so you can see the face and the being and feel the beams of love. And it may be more than one person, that's fine. And it may you may not see anyone right away, that's also fine. Just allow and relax and see who wants to come.
and you may not see them clearly, but you may just feel their goodness, feel their love, feel their beams surrounding you. And when you do, I want you to put one of your concerns, one of your burdens down before them. Just say, I have a question, I have a burden. What do you say about this? Ask a question or just lay down a burden. I need help with my daughter. I need assurance about my health. What do you give me? What kind of guidance can you give me about this or that question? Take a minute to lay down one of the things that burdens you before them. It's okay to ask for help and see what comes back. Will they be willing to help you? Is there an answer coming your way? Let your feelings come. Let your tears come. And hear what you need to hear. And when you're ready, give thanks, give a bow. Give your gratitude and turn to walk back, finding your seat in 2021 in your body, grounded with all of us together, wiggling your toes, rubbing your hands together, and we'll come back. So my friends, we're uh, at the top of the hour now and time for sharing and time for questions. Um, our beloved Gabriel will, will moderate that. We'll, we'll trust that everyone will be brief so as many people can, can share. You can share anything and ask anything. First of all, I love coming to your talks on this book because they're all different. <laughs> you come up with different things with every one. That's really, I learn every time, so thank you. Um, and I'm just curious if you could say a little bit more about this, um, this new science of epigenetics and the impact of trauma from one generation to the next, and specifically about, okay, so lots of us have had that, you know, that passed down to us. Um, in terms of epigenetics, how do you heal that? Yes. Or is it simply what you were saying before? I suspect there's more. It, yes, there's more. I mean, I'm breaking it down into remember, tell, and find meaning. Uh, but there's so much, there's a whole science there. And, um, you know, we know that for three and four generations after some terrible event has happened historically, for instance, one of the, one of the groundbreaking, one of the groundbreaking cases was the Dutch hunger, uh, winter. They call it the Dutch hunger winter. And if you look that up online, the Dutch hunger winter was the, uh, was the winter of 1944 and 45 when there was an embargo around the Scandinavian countries and nothing could get in. And it was understood even in the 1940s that women who were carrying children who were pregnant during that Dutch hunger winter when there was literally people were passing out and dying on the streets because people were so hungry and malnourished, um, uh, that, those, that those babies would be impacted, right? So we knew that. We Even science knew that then, of course. Uh, they were being malnourished and they would have difficulty in their lives. But nobody predicted that the three generations hence, uh, that their grandchildren would be impacted and that their grandchildren would have a propensity for depression, anxiety, and all kinds of heart disease and uh, bipolar disorder. So once you know that you have that, it's like gene testing, genetic testing. If you know that you have a certain gene, you can you can work. You're not. You, it's really important not ever to be passive, 
Uh, and that's really one of the points here is that we, you know, we had COVID, those of us who went passive with it didn't do as well as those who, whatever, went walking, called friends, did, you know, reached out. Uh, so if you have a propensity, a predisposition for uh, an epigenetic carriage of stress, of of trauma, you know that you can work and, and counteract it with healthy living, with uh, with things like Kavod, with having friends, with playing tennis, with getting out and walking and finding beauty and, and working against that tide. Uh, it's like knowing that you have diabetes, for instance, in your family, So, uh, which I do. And at a young age, uh, in my 20s, I was told by my doctor, you are going to get diabetes unless you really work on your diet and you really make a point to exercise. And I've never even gone near it. Thank God. I mean, with the, with the grace of God, um, because once you know that you have trauma in your predisposition, you, you know, you keep yourself, uh, you work with stress in different ways. And I know that probably uh, many of you have experiences of that, how you've worked with the stress. So great question, much more to say, Rabbi Steve, but uh, we'll leave it there. I hate to bring you back to that because I know you said you'll let it go with there, from there. Um, how, how does, I was wondering the same thing that the rabbi asked, but I didn't know how to ask it and I still don't know how to ask it. Um, we know um, that, that people, people have had experiences, we'll hear about them, know about them, find out about them. Um, how do we, how does that actually go into our DNA? Um, how does it, uh, does it, is that what you're saying? That it actually goes into the DNA, giving us a change in that, our, um, that's a perfect question, Leah. Um, because it's really, that's the question that you asked. Does it change my genetic code? No, it doesn't change your genetic code, but what it does, epigenetics means, uh, epi means on top of genetics. It's on top of our, our DNA coil that we have the stress forms little strands called methyl, methylinization. And uh, those strands um, it could inhibit gene expression. And what that means is that how well our genes work, giving our brain the message, you're in stress right now, you need to bounce back, you need to learn street smarts, you need to be fast on your feet. And when we have the overlay of those strands, our, our genetic expression, how our genes work well, gets inhibited. So we won't be as capable of being resilient and being fast on our feet and being quick in our minds because we have this, it's almost like a sludge. <laughs> it's almost like a sludge in the system. And uh, so it, and, and I have seen this many times in my work since I started studying these uh, trauma legacies that when people do the work of saying, oh, um, there's one woman that I work with who's from Amsterdam, whose uh, whose father uh, and mother, independent of each other, both were hidden as children, just like Anne Frank. Her mother died very young. Her father kept everything secret, and she's just found all the letters. Uh, and her father told her on the on his deathbed the whole story. And so in her working this through, she is becoming, it's like digesting, it's metabolizing the history that she didn't know. And it's, um, she's less exhausted. She feels all this energy. She is, um, she's, uh, she, she's changing. Her life is changing. She's in her, she's in her fifties. So there is this big release of energy. Hi, uh, I'm so thankful to Kavo because you guys started this in 2013, right? I, yes, I believe that was our first year, yeah. I took my mom and dad 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then of course 20, we didn't, and then my mom died in October. So I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm really thankful that, um, that I was able to take my parents because it really helped them out. And even though they're not Jewish and I am, it, it was, it was just, it really was great. So I'm just 
telling you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so happy to hear the tears flowing. It's really life-giving. It's good. I would just like to ask the rabbi if you, if you use historical trauma as a definition of what you just described in terms of our ancestral, um, in terms of epigenic, ep epigenetics. Well, historical trauma is a term that, uh, you know, that Jews should know about uh, as well as, as well as all ethnicities um, who have a history of discrimination, like we do uh, displacement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we were the, the scapegoated uh, by, by, by the societies that we lived in through history. And what this uh, field tells us is that there is a byproduct uh, that the past doesn't just simply evaporate but that there's a byproduct that lives in people that makes us strong it makes us power it may, once we work with it it gives us so many good things uh, and it's really important not to push our past under and uh, that's really true uh, that's true for us as individuals too right we've all lived through terrible things <laughs> We've all lost loved ones. Um, we don't want to push those under. We want to tell the stories. We want to, um, we want to be heard. We want to um, say Kaddish. We want to uh, observe the yard sites and the yiskers and cry those tears. That makes for health. And uh, on a, that's on a personal level. On a global level, on a national level, we want to have those memorials at Holocaust Memorial Day, we want to go, we want to pray together, we want to remember our history, not to dwell on it. And it's really, I want to make a very um, clear point here. It's not just to dwell on it and feel like we're the victims of history or any of that. That, my book, my book goes into that quite, quite a bit. It's really because those of us who have gone through these, his, this historical trauma have a special a special responsibility and a special privilege because we can feel more. Uh, that is an epigenetic legacy that is positive. We can feel the pain of others more. We can, we can feel the heartbreak of others, especially during these hard, hard times. We can reach out. We, we, we can feel when somebody is hurting and we get a sixth sense about that. And uh, so we can reach out to one another and that's a special honor to have. And that's a good byproduct of our historical trauma. This is phenomenal. Um, Rabbi, is journaling that we're encouraged to do today through many different sources, is that considered an adequate modern version of telling and then finding meaning? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm a rabid journaler and I have been all my life since I was a little girl. I've written down my, my, uh, my dreams and I've talked to my ancestors in my journal in an imaginary way. Uh, I think it, it, it goes a long way. It goes a long way. And as we know from our beloved Anne Frank and others whose journals we have, historical journals, uh, we know that it, it helped people stay sane. Uh, so it is indeed a really good way to process, uh, to digest what's going on. Um, it's also harder, I think, to talk to people because sometimes you get, you get the wrong response or they launch into their story or they don't hear so well or they you know, don't get the point of what you're trying to say. Uh, but I do think uh, telling people and really good hearing is really important. But I am a very big, very big proponent of journaling. So yes, continue with your journaling. That's yeah. a good way to tell. Um, I completely believe in reincarnation and uh, know it's a Jewish belief. Um, what does the, uh, oh gosh. The re oh, how how does that affect? I have I specifically me uh, hit my head dozens of times in my life. I uh, have had very bad injuries on my head. What makes 
is that the epigenetic you think or what is that because i i believe when we get reincarnated we may not come back in the same um family um that we don't come back to the same people it's only the soul that comes back with the same souls but um the hitting of my head i've actually done some regressions to find out why i have hit my head so much and um it, do, if, do you know anybody that does past life regressions like Brian Weiss's work? And um, what do you th what do you make of that? That uh, I mean, it's like I'm I never know when I'm going to get my head hit. Um, oh my gosh! And you feel like that's a, a sign from past lives, Leo? Um, I thought it was, and I thought I had cleaned it up, and I had a lot of years that I did not have had injuries and then I suddenly started getting them again. So I thought that I had really found the answer and I was amazed when I did. I, I'd love to tell you about it because I think you I think you you know what I'm talking about, right, Terza? Oh interesting. The pattern that you have. I if if it were me, I would probably um <laughs> this is a little bit off off your uh, in another direction, but I would probably ask uh, a wise and well ancestor in your lineage to help you out to break that pattern. Your I think poor, I'm the oldest one left. <laughs> your forehead. So someone on the other side who can help you break that pattern. Now, in terms of reincarnation, um, Jews from, again, it's a time-honored uh, piece of uh, of wisdom in the Kabbalah that Jews believe in reincarnation, that souls keep coming back as a way of polishing ourselves and perfecting ourselves. And the Alter Rebbe, the uh, Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Liadi said, somebody asked him, do you really believe in reincarnation? He goes, everyone believes in reincarnation, but it's only a silly soul who waits for the next one to start to start working on it. And his idea was that we that we start now to perfect ourselves so that the next incarnation is a holy incarnation. But, um, but I, I, again, I think that you subscribe to uh, the fact that there are worlds beyond this world and that there are holy ancestors on the other side, whether or not you know their names. And I would just make a prayer for you that you be protected and live a long, healthy life without having to keep reinstating that pattern because you don't need to keep knocking your poor brain. You've got a good brain there. You've got a good, a good cup. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't knock it.